are gonna get crazy! <laughs> Most everyone's mad <laughs> Hello, everyone! Welcome back to another exciting episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast! How are you all doing, everyone? I hope you had a good uh, past few weeks. I know that I did skip the last one, mainly because, well, there wasn't enough stories to go and cover, and, well, that was to be expected, considering that it was American Thanksgiving, and then most people, well, they weren't necessarily reporting entertainment news, they were mostly on the side with their families and having dinner and all that kind of stuff. So, that was to be expected, and yeah, let me yeah. just say that it was actually, oh, by the way, thank you very much, uh, Jay Monty, for the subscription right there. Uh, but as I was saying, uh, it was actually a good thing that I did skip last week because, to be very honest with you all, I actually did have a burnout. Uh, it's just that I've been working on so many of these reviews to the point that I guess it did get to me, and oh boy, did I feel physically weak, and my and my morale was just absolutely lo uh, absolutely low. But thankfully, I did take a couple of days, like just not working at all, just take the time to spend outside, and it was just wonderful. Yeah! Now, oh. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, MetaRalph, for the uh, subscription as well. But also, uh, I do want to say, though, that even though today didn't necessarily start out great for me because, well, there was a massive snowstorm and it was the first day of this winter that I got to get into some shoveling. So that wasn't really that fun. But hey, now that I got that done, I can stay indoors, I can stay warm, and I can go and get into this episode talking about some of the crazy news that has recently happened with you all. And boy, do I have some very fascinating stories to go and discuss. So, with all that said and done, everyone, I would like to know, are you all ready for today's episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Castle? Let me hear it, folks. Are we all ready? So, let me see now. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great to see. I see now that everybody is coming. Everybody is here. Yeah. Everybody is now going to be discussing. And uh, thank you for the gifted sub there. And now, with all that said and done, it is now time that we shall go and get things started. And with our first story that I have over here, we might as well go and start off a little bit easy, and we are going to be checking out a trailer. Now, I know that there have been a few trailers that did come out, and many people did talk about that Furiosa trailer, which already it seems like it could possibly hype things up for an anticipated summer blockbuster for next year. But what I want to talk about instead is going to be a series, specifically a live-action animation hybrid series, one that brings back uh, a certain movie from the 2010s, and now he's going to be returning into his own show. So with that said and done, let's go and begin this by taking a look at the trailer for the upcoming Peacock series, Ted. Hi everyone, Seth MacFarlane here, and I am thrilled. And that was... Head, to which it will be coming soon on Peacock, I believe, uh, in Gen- yeah, uh, specifically January 11th. And let me tell you, folks, as you probably have seen, uh, through my reactions just by watching this, honestly, yeah, not gonna lie, I actually do find this funny. Uh, I remember I did watch uh, the the original Ted movie back, uh, not necessarily when it was theater, it, when it was in theaters, but like not long afterwards. Uh, I remember watching it, and I mean, it wasn't necessarily the most hilarious movie, but I mean, I did have a good time. It was a funny film. Uh, I didn't watch Ted 2, however, so I'm not that familiar. So uh, at the most, I remember watching the first movie, and... I remember having a decently enjoyable time. But when I did watch this trailer of the Ted series, I just gotta say that I was surprised how laugh out loud funny it is. Like, a lot of these jokes are absolutely absurd. And I'm just gonna state right now. 
I am aware that not everybody is going to like this series. Like, it does have an acquired taste when it comes to its humor, that it is more the kind that it is unapologetically raunchy. So I do get it if there are some people who were turned off by watching this particular trailer. Okay, I get it. But those who can get into it, my god, like, this really is the kind that just... It leans in on just the stupidity and really has fun with it. And I think that really is the big highlight. It's just, in a way, it's very much self-aware of its own absurdity and its own stupidity. And it just fully embraces it. It doubles down. It triples down on just the stupid brand of humor. Like, really going all out in terms of, like, the kinds of jokes with sex and drugs and, and all that kind of stuff that, like, they would really lean into when it comes to, like, PG-13 or rated R comedies and stuff like that. And I mean, I think I, I, I got, like, several highlights, but if I would have to point out my one favorite joke, it would actually be, like, near the end, like, with, uh, like, Ted trying to help out John in terms of his uh, virginity. So he just openly offers it to everyone in school, like... You gotta find a buyer. Fresh penis! Get your fresh penis here. Jesus Christ. It still has that new penis smell. <laughs> okay, this I gotta say, that was actually really funny. Oh my god. Like, imagine just going out in public and just trying to try to sell it like some kind of used car salesman. <laughs> fresh penis! Forget your fresh penis, eh? <laughs> oh, that that is just fantastic. And I mean, there there are also some other jokes as well. Like, um, but also another like one thing that I was surprised that I also really enjoyed is the, the the sensible father. Like, this isn't necessarily the kind of, like, caring or loving father. This is the kind, like, he's very straightforward and pretty short-tempered. And honestly, a lot of his reactions were also hilarious. Like, um, the moment when Ted and John get, like, stupidly high, like, with whatever drugs that they would go and get... And, like, he's the only one that seems to be making the most sense, realizing that something is up, like, right over here. Some reality. Is there a fucking gas leak or something? <laughs> okay, that one was also great. I mean, there's definitely a whole lot of, of these, like, really absurdly funny moments. And I think one thing that it did, it, or a few things that this did honestly remind me of, and first and foremost, considering that this is a Seth MacFarlane series, um, one thing that this Ted trailer really reminds me a lot about is early Family Guy. I don't mean, like, Family Guy, like, how it is now, or that, like, Family Guy, how it's been, like, rolling along over these years. I mean, like, yeah! among the first few years of Family Guy, and, uh, ooh, another gifted sub, thank you very much. Uh, but I I as I was saying... Um, I, I feel like it, it very much has that similar kind of tone of how Family Guy has started uh, amongst its first few years. Like when it started to become very popular, it reminds me of that where it has those types of jokes that just really leans in to the absurdity or to the, the sheer stupidity of the moments just to really make an effective comedy. And that's why it also reminds me of another group of shows that has that similar tone. It's kind of like the early Adult Swim days, you know, the kind of shows uh, that are like Aqua Teen Hunger Force, that it's not necessarily about having some kind of compelling plot or complex characters or anything like that. It reminds me of the kind of shows where it just leans in on the comedy and just be unapologetically stupid with whatever uh, they would go on those. Just really lean in on just turn off your brain and just enjoy the adult-like stupidity in which like they would lean in on some uh, more mature subject matter, rather it be talking about drugs, talking about sex, or talking about like whatever things that t teenagers or adults would get through in life. Again, I know that is not everyone's type of humor. I know like some people might feel a bit disgusted or grossed out, uh, especially when they when they lean in hard on um, on like the sex, the drugs, and especially the language. In fact, even I felt a little bit shocked of how the trailer like they would just lean in on the swearing just like 
so much, like so many times, where they, where all the characters would just go and unapologetically swear, like throwing the S and the Fs and all that kind of stuff. But still, though, like I, I think it might be the kind, like it's a make or break deal. Like if this is not your humor, you're gonna hate it. But if you enjoy that type of comedy, I think Ted could really deliver on that great so honestly in my opinion as someone who really did enjoy this trailer i got a feeling that if i do watch this series and i watch like the episodes i think i may end up having a great time but i i would but it is true i would have to be in the right mindset if i want to watch something stupid if i just want to turn off my brain and enjoy the absurdity of everything i know i keep i keep repeating the words stupidity and absurdity but i mean that's kind of the best way to describe what i have witnessed with this ted trailer Honestly, I feel like if I'm in that right mindset of just wanting something dumb, then I think I'm going to have a great time with this. So, uh, with all that said, if you are interested in checking out the TED trailer, uh, then keep in mind it will be coming soon on Peacock starting January 11th. And with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall, and now I want to ask you all, what do you all think about this TED trailer? Did you really get on board with this? Did you have a great time? Are you a little bit iffy about it? Let me know what you all think. All right, let's see uh, what we got. I'll be honest, I myself haven't seen either of the Ted movies, but I will say this trailer was pretty funny. I actually laughed at some of the jokes. Uh, I actually laughed, and some of the jokes... Oh, uh, hold on a second. Best, uh, some of the jokes... And this could please fans of the movie. So overall, I don't think this series is going to be great, but it seems like it'll be dumb, stupid fun. All right. Uh, let's see. Ted was a great movie, and Ted 2 existed. So I was a little on the fence about this series. But thankfully, it looks pretty funny. The CG of Ted lo uh, still looks top-notch. The chemistry between Ted and Johnny is as great as it was in the films. And the idea of a prequel series lends itself to a ton of funny ideas. I honestly can't wait to check it out. Even if uh, uh, even if I have to do it while pretending uh, people with Peter P Peter's pretending Peter on Fortnite... Can't believe I get to say that now. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. And you do actually bring up a, a good point. Like, even when looking at this, uh, like, the animation on Ted is that, like, um, it, it actually does look very nice. Like, you, you, you look at the CG, and I mean, like, that, that, like in, in fact, it's actually one of the better aspects of the Ted movies, where the CG that they did on Ted, like, it looks massively realistic, and they did very well with this. It looks incredible. Uh, that and also, like, it is true, considering that it is going to be a prequel series, and that it will be set in the 1990s, so in a way, some people could say it's kind of like a reset, uh, like a retro or period piece, or, or, or stuff like that. Uh, but honestly, yeah, I could definitely see how this can also really play up with the 90s aesthetic. So uh, that could also be something to really look forward to with Ted. It's just the how are they going to approach the raunchiness with the 1990s kind of tone. So we'll see how, how it goes with that. All right, let's see. Finally, a Peacock show I'm extremely excited for. I love the first Ted movie so much, and I can't wait to see it soon. I laugh so hard at the masturbation joke. I mean, I get that a lot in high school, but yeah, I'll definitely watch it soon. Yeah, you know, I'm not gonna lie. I feel like, you know, it's been quite a while since I've seen Ted. I should actually rewatch it. Like, if I am going to commit myself to watching this Ted series, if I am going to do so, then I know eventually I'll have to rewatch uh, the, the, at least the first Ted movie. I need to see that again. Oh boy. Because like, I, I'm surprised like a lot of people are saying, it's like, oh, it's great. It's great. You know, I, I don't know if it's because like it never made that much of an impact on me, but yeah, I think like, you know, I think I need to give uh, Ted another chance. I mean, I did enjoy it, but like, I need like a fresh reminder of how the first Ted is. <laughs> uh, but you know, the funny thing is though, I still remember the, uh, the thunder song, uh, the, the thunder song, F. You thunder! <laughs> All right, anyways, um, when it comes to Ted, I have only seen the first film and I thought it was funny while having some heart throughout, but I didn't see the second film because I heard it was awful. For this series, despite the fact that it was filmed at Universal Studios, including the clock tower area from Back to the Future, it looked all right. It has some funny moments here and there, but I'll give it a wait and see when it comes to the story and the comedy. All right. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, Ted was my most enjoyable comedy movie alongside with Happy Madison's The Benchwarmers. 
I was expecting Ted's new series would become animated with Family Guy animation, but a part of me is telling that maybe this might not be a good idea as the movie, but we'll see. The ones that made me laugh were the dad saying, you gotta go to school and you gotta get a freaking brain. And yes, the ending made me laugh as well. Overall, I'm excited and I'm keeping an eye out for this series. All right, awesome. Uh, let's see. Um, I may not have seen the Ted movies, but this trailer has me laughing my ass at everything. The jokes are so funny. I also like the CGI on Ted. It looks nice. As someone who hasn't seen Ted, this is giving me some good impressions. Love that penis joke, though. That is hilarious. Oh, my God. <laughs> who knew that the biggest moment of like, th who knows? Maybe this is going to be the whole mo the, the biggest moment of this uh, entire podcast episode. It's all about fresh penis. Get your fresh penis here. <laughs> all right. I'll read one more comment before we go on to our first break. Uh, let's see now. Uh, this show looks like a lot of fun, but if I know Seth MacFarlane, then you know he does better in a hardcore PG-13 setting rather than an R-rated setting or even NC-17 setting, or you could just say, uh, what you want outright without having to be clever about it. Uh, what's up far is clever. That's when he's a lot more better and worth watching, uh, than when he just, uh, he just being raunchy for round's sake. Let's just hope that Seth MacFarlane can be a lot more clever with his jokes. If so, great. If not, well, yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, actually, there is one more. Actually, let me just go and cap off with this one. Uh, to say I have seen the movie when I was going through a phase of breaking out of my shell, and I would say I did enjoy some things about it. And after seeing this trailer, I will say that the humor was pretty funny in some scenarios they throw in there. Therefore, if this comes out, I will say absolutely not even after going through the funny scenes i still do not like adult humor gross me out so past all right so maybe again maybe not for everyone but i do see there is definitely a good amount of anticipation for this so if you are excited in checking out the ted series again keep in mind that it will be coming out on peacock january 11th and now we are going to go on to our first break and when we do come back we will have a discussion about disney because Oh boy, are they not in good shape. So we'll have that discussion soon. And welcome back. Now, our next story and what could possibly be the main story of this episode is going to be in regards to Disney. Now, I am aware that maybe some people might not necessarily think that I'm probably the best person to go and have a discussion about the subject matter, uh, especially when I did recently release my review of Wish, and I honestly did find it to be a pretty solid film. I mean, I don't think it's Disney's best movie, and certainly not the best animated film this year, but Honestly, I'm on the side where, honestly, I actually really did enjoy it. Yes, there are flaws, but I do feel like some of the pros of it do make things up for it, including the animation, the voice acting, uh, and some of the songs as well. So honestly, I do find it to be good. It's unfortunate that it's getting the reception that it is right now. Uh, but still, though, like I, I, I do actually like it as a film as is uh but from there i know that like some people were really turned off by my comments or even giving any form of positivity towards wish i have been called a disney shill or a disney fanboy or whatever but what can i say my opinion is my opinion what else do you want me to do uh but from there though I do acknowledge, however, that things are not going great towards Disney, and I do acknowledge that they do have a massive problem, and that is especially the case with what's been going on this year. Yes, it has been reported that for the first time since 2014, without counting the pandemic years like 2020 or 2020 or 2021, it is the first time ever that Disney does not have a movie that has made over a billion dollars. Now, technically, this does not mean that all the Disney movies have failed, because there have been a few successes that Disney did have, at least in terms of the box office. There was Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, that is Disney's biggest hit, and made a total, I believe, of $850 million, or around that, at the box office. And then, of course, there was Elemental, uh, that was a very unexpected surprise, and in the long run, it did manage to find a, 
a way to become profitable and to actually be successful. And then, well, debatably, there was the Little Mermaid remake. It did make a good chunk of money at the box office, but I know some people might be debating maybe it might have turned a profit, maybe it broke even, maybe it may not. And the big factor is uh, the way that the budget is just way too stupidly big. So, um, the bit, so honestly, if, the Little Mermaid was a success at the box office is honestly debatable. But with that said, maybe not all of the movies uh, were bombs, but a good chunk of them, unfortunately, well, they have not made their money at the box office. We have recently seen Wish, in which uh, uh, that turned out to be a massive disappointment financially. Uh, then there have been some other movies in the past as well, like the Marvel films, such as uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, and uh, even recently with the Marvels. There was also the Haunted Mansion that was a failure, and even Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. So there have been a good chunk of those films, and a lot of these that Disney was really hyping up, even giving them exuberant budgets, on average like $200 million, and even some might even have $300 million. And yeah, I think it is safe to say that in terms of the movie division for Disney, they have been having an extremely rough year. So, in that regard, I just gotta go and say that I understand that, you know, it happens often when movies don't become successful and in the case here um with disney not not having a great year or even a good year whatsoever i think like one thing that really is a massive highlight is just the overwhelming amount that is just not working because it's one thing if there's only one property that's not doing well like some people would go and argue like Oh, well, the Marvel movies are not necessarily doing great, but hey, at least Disney is still making their money with their animated films. No, 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 no. It's not like that. This is a case in which it is proven that none are really working out great. You know, none of them are as strong as what they used to be back in 2019. Because keep in mind, like, and this is the one thing that whenever these discussions are brought up, a lot of people would go and compare to how Disney was a few years ago in 2019, when they had a total of seven movies that made over a billion dollars at the box office. You, re you may remember that time, like with uh, Captain Marvel, The Avengers, Rise of Skywalker, Toy Story 4, Frozen 2, uh, uh, did I say Avengers Endgame? Uh, probably I have. Uh, oh, the uh, the Aladdin remake and the Lion King remake. And you could debatably say seven and a half because there is also Spider-Man Far From Home. But the point is, the majority of movies that have made over a billion dollars was from Disney. Nowadays, none. Zero. In fact, even this year, there have only been two movies that have made over a billion dollars at the box office with the Mario movie and Barbie. That's it. And even though I did state that, well, technically, they did have one good hit with Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, it is still pretty far off from actually making a billion dollars at the box office. And going back to what I was talking about, the big issue is just how overwhelming in which none of their properties are really working in terms of really bringing in the cash at the box office. Disney Animation is not really working right now. Pixar is not really working as well as it used to be. Then there's also Marvel that's really not working. Lucasfilm that's not working. Even some like niche areas like movies based on rides like they were just starting but people are just are already feeling tired of it and they didn't really want to. Yeah maybe like they got you know they they kind of got curious with the Jungle Cruise but then suddenly the mansion came in and it's like nah no way and suddenly the movie became as dead as those ghosts in there. You know like like, well, there's always room for a thousand, so you know what? Here's the 2023 movie. So, yeah, it's just like so much of it is just not been working well. So what the fridge is going on? What is it that's leading to Disney like like constantly failing at the box office? What is it about like how is it that suddenly the Disney name is not necessarily that profitable at the box office? And um, on, on top, the thing is, like, I know, I'll just say this now, that it is definitely true that um, there are some circumstances that were beyond Disney's control. 
It is true that technically factors such as uh, the pandemic really did a massive number on Disney. That definitely is true. And then there's also the factor of like the recent strike that might have taken a bit of a toll uh, towards the company as well. So there are some outside factors beyond that are not Disney's fault. But most of it, however, I would say that, yes, it actually is Disney's fault. Oh, and by the way, before I continue, I just want to go and state right now that what I'm about to discuss here and like uh, getting into some of the reasons why Disney's movies haven't really been profitable. Um, I, I will state like one video that I highly recommend that you go and watch that does discuss this similar topic is actually from Double Toasted. They actually made a discussion about this and talking about uh, why is it that Disney's movies haven't been so successful lately. And honestly, I was like, even though, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, folks, but um. Even though, like, uh, it did, you know, it did seem a bit clickbaity with their title and with the thumbnail and stuff like that, but never judge a book by its cover. They were actually very fair on their analysis and their criticisms towards Disney. So I highly recommend that you go and check it out. Uh, and I will admit there might be some things that I will go and repeat what Corey and Martin has said in there because they have brought up some amazingly good points. Uh, but anyways, uh, back to what I was talking about. Uh, the thing is with uh, Disney, yes, a lot of it is their fault because it really is just the mismanagement now is starting to take a toll and it's affecting their feature films. I mean, you, you already know that I made an entire video talking about the whole situation in regards to Bob Chapek. But we cannot blame the entirety on Bob Chapek because right now, even Bob Iger is not really doing that great. Let's just say he's not as admirable right now as he was before uh, Bob Chapek. Like he wasn't as admirable back like in the, the, the 2010s and stuff like that. And you could tell with this mismanagement, it's just so much of it. Disney has pretty much ha have gone to the point where now they're just focusing on quantity over quality and i'll even say that i feel like one of their biggest problems right now is actually disney plus i mean yeah sure disney plus is one of disney's greatest assets right now but it's also kind of becoming their worst enemy to the point where now they just keep on pumping content after content after content after content to the point where now their ips just don't feel as special as what they used to be and people are starting to feel a bit exhausted of the amount of content that Disney would go and put out on each of these different things. It, it honestly just feels too much to the point where even if they would put some stuff out on the big screen, they don't necessarily feel as special as what they used to do or as what they used to be like with all the marvel content that keep pushing that 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 they keep putting out especially during phase four and phase five now there's just been way too many things that people would have to go and catch up on to the point where like now it's just you, you have to spend an unnecessary amount of hours just to watch some content in order to understand something like the Marvels or Ant-Man and, uh, and the Wasp Quantumania or whatever. It's like the fear of what people had uh, in regards to the Marvel Cinematic Universe of like the incredible amount of research that you have to do just to understand what is going on. Like, unfortunately, it started to go and come true. So that's one significant factor where, like, it became so problematic. And, like, it's also affecting some of their other properties as well, including Star Wars. I can guarantee you, if Disney would go and release a Star Wars movie right now at the box office, that would also become a box office flop because people are getting a bit tired of Star Wars, especially with all the content that they would go and put out on Disney+. Plus, Especially when even those... Like, they can be a bit iffy. Sometimes they can be great. Like, um, the uh, I haven't seen it, but, like, apparently the Ahsoka series has been getting a lot of high praise. Or they could be, they could be pretty weak, like the latest season of The Mandalorian. And I would especially say that is also the case with Disney animation. And that's been a discussion that I know a lot of animation fans have been having a whole lot where the whole strategy of taking the Pixar movies and some of the Disney movies and just putting it on Disney Plus, like, it turned out to be a bad strategy that ended up screwing them over. That it pretty much trained the public to, to go and wait for Disney Plus if Disney would want to go, you know, like, to, to, to wait 
until they would release the animated content on Disney Plus so that they could go and enjoy it. And that's what we have seen, especially with the Pixar films like Soul, Luca, and Turning Red. All great movies, by the way, but unfortunately never had a chance to be on the big screen because of the pandemic. So Disney had to go and resort to just putting them onto Disney Plus, and that's it. And that played a key factor into how some of the other Disney movies did not do well at the box office, such as Lightyear and Strange World. I know some people could argue there are other factors as well, but that is a key notion. And there is one argument I haven't seen a lot of people talk about, but I feel like this is the one thing that in the long run, it has really screwed them over hard. And that is Encanto. I know it seems like a little bit of a, a shocker right there, but the reason why I'm bringing up Encanto is that many people may have forgotten of the fact that Encanto was a box office bomb. It was actually released in theaters on November of 2021, and it didn't really make that much money. However, when it was released on Disney+, Plus, that's when it became a phenomenon. That's when people were really introduced to We Don't Talk About Bruno. That's when things really got big for Encanto. And that, and that also brings up a little bit of an issue as well, because from that point on, it gave audiences a choice. What would you rather do with Disney movies? Do you want to go and see them on the big screen or wait for Disney Plus? And that really did play a far bigger role in trying to make people choose to wait until the animated projects would go onto Disney Plus. And honestly, this is a problem that's still being affected today. And I will say, like, with Elemental, it got, again, it got so lucky that it became a box office hit. It got so lucky that it managed to go and turn a profit just on the box office alone. But then again, nowadays, considering that with Elemental, it's a lot more positively received and, you know, great, because that's also another really good film, I find. Uh, but the thing is, with, uh, Ele with, with, Elemental, with, with Elemental, though, the thing is, that thing is really, you know, like, w when that came out on Disney+, Plus. That's when we see a much wider audience coming in. And that's also another massive significant factor as to why Wish is not doing well at the box office. Because, you know, considering that the reception, well, it's not been great, you know, it's pretty divided right now where people either enjoy it or they absolutely hate it. There's no emergency for people to go and watch it on the big screen. People are saying that now they're just going to be patient. And if they choose to actually go and watch Wish, they're just going to wait for it on Disney Plus, and that's it. And apparently, the scenario with Wish on the big screen right now, I, I, I heard a rumor. Now, I just want to state this right now. I don't know how true this is, but apparently, I've been told that there may be a chance that Disney, even though it's only been like a, 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 a few weeks right now, maybe like a, a two weeks that Wish has been on the big screen, they're going to pull it out. Uh, they're they're going to pull it away. Like, there is a chance that Disney is going to choose to completely remove Wish from all the big screens because right now, Wish is doing so bad to the point that it is now more profitable to not show Wish in cinemas instead of actually showing Wish uh, in cinemas. Again, I don't know how true this might be, but, it you know, if, if that's the case, then it shows that there is... A massive problem right now so the whole point that I am getting into is just that right now it really shows that Disney Plus can be a massive detriment to Disney like now it is a bit of a problem where it's affecting their movies on the big screen and there is also another problem with Disney and well a big part of why is it that like a good chunk of their films have been major box office bombs and that is the fact that Disney is getting a little bit too confident in their brand name. Like Disney was thinking that just because it's Disney, somehow it's going to make money. And that confidence ended up really screwing them over because they, they felt so high and mighty after 2019 that they think that, okay, well, you know, we're going to put in like $200 million or $300 million on this movie, and we're going to go and definitely get to make our money back, you know, because we're Disney and people want to watch Disney movies. But that's not necessarily the case because now people are reading into the formulas that they are putting out. Like now the movies themselves, like the qualities of the movies themselves 
are, are, are proven to be formulaic and now people are not really that interested. Like they know what they're getting into and they're not necessarily um, that into it. You know, they're not necessarily that uh, comfortable to go and say um, they want to get it, you know, that they don't want to go and actually want to watch it. And that's especially the case what we have seen with the Marvel suddenly becoming formulaic. The, mo uh, the movies based on rides are becoming formulaic. Even the Lucasfilm projects are being formulaic, whether it be Indiana Jones or even um, uh, even Star Wars. And some of the animated offerings are being formulaic, whether it be from Pixar or Disney. Again, I like Wish. I like Elemental. I think they're both really enjoyable and solid films on their own. I do think they're well made. But I also do think that Disney would have done a better job at it. They are still flawed. And the stories especially are pretty weak and there is definitely a whole lot more room for improvement onto that and unfortunately it became a detriment where now well you know it's kind of predictable and people don't want don't really want to go and watch it because like with that kind of formula you can't say like well it's disney they're formulaic and so no rush to go and immediately see it and that's why overall with disney they haven't necessarily been um, going that great at the box office. And, you know, I will say, though, that, that, like, even though this, like, is not necessarily a great thing right now with how uh, uh, Disney, you know, with how Disney is going, I will say, though, that this is a good thing for the company. I think there, this is actually... Uh, you know, this is actually a very humbling experience for Disney and something that they kind of need. It's a little bit of a wake-up call for them to go and realize that they cannot just capitalize on the name alone. They can't just go and release something and just say that they're Disney and suddenly expect money to magically appear. What they, you know, this is a, a wake-up call for Disney to realize they gotta go and do something. They need to go and reform themselves and rethink about their strategy, not just on, not just for their movies on the big screen, but also on Disney Plus. How are they gonna go and approach each of their properties to make sure that they actually do focus on quality instead of quantity? And I know that some people are saying that right now, Disney has confirmed that they are going to be doing this with Marvel, where they are going to be pushing back in terms of how much uh, how much projects are they going to go and release, rather it be just on Disney Plus or even on the big screen, which is why next year in 2024, the only MCU project they are going to be putting out is going to be Deadpool 3, and that's it. Uh, or at least in terms of the ones that are coming out on the big screen. But honestly, I feel like they should go and do more of that. Honestly, I think they should go and expand on their other properties where they should go and focus on quantity over qual uh, quality over quantity so that they can go and um, focus to make sure that each project actually works out great. And this might be a bit of a hot take. I feel like from what we have been experiencing, I think they should do the same with their animated works and only release one animated movie a year on the big screen. And when I say that, I don't mean from like one year, you know, one from Pixar and one for Disney. No, 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 no. I mean legit, only one and that's it. Like one year, you put out a Pixar movie. Then the next year, you put out a Disney movie. And that way, not only will it help where that you don't just go and throw out $200 million movies like periodically at a time, but also it increases the value so that it becomes more special when you would go and release those movies. So that whenever they do come out and it's like, oh, hey, look, a Pixar movie or a Disney animation movie. It's been a while, so why not go and check it out? So at least it gives more value to the brand where it becomes, uh, you know, that it becomes less frequent that they would go and bring out their next projects again and again. So, uh, uh, but that is just my opinion, though. So maybe that can work. That might not, but we will see. Uh, however, there is also one thing that I do want to point out. And it's that, yes, I do understand why everybody has been focusing so much on Disney, mainly because of the fact that, well, they ha they are technically considered the biggest entertainment company. And, well, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And, yeah, like, uh, compared to how they were in 2019, that is a big fall. But that doesn't mean that the others are doing better. Like most of the other studios, they have been struggling hard. Even if they would go and release a billion dollar movie, 
They haven't been doing great, and they have their own sets of flops. Uh, a few examples I can think of. Warner Brothers. Like, I know Warner Brothers did put out the highest grossing movie of the year with Barbie, but I would argue and say that, well, I think Warner Brothers might be having a worse 100th anniversary than Disney, especially when all their other films have been disasters, especially the DC movies. Every single one of them way too over budgeted and just turned out to be a massive major flop. And then there's also Sony, for example. Yes, Sony did put out Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse and that was a huge hit. But what else did they put out that is like, what you know, that, that like managed to turn a profit? What else that Sony did put out that actually turned out well? Because I could tell you right now, Napoleon is kind of on the same boat as Wish right now. So Napoleon is not at the point where it could be arguing that, oh, we're doing better. It's like, nah, you ain't, man. You ain't doing Sony any favors. Or another one that I could think of. Well, okay. Um, I would argue that maybe, maybe Universal is having a decent year. Considering that they did put out Oppenheimer. They had a billion dollar hit with Mario. And they did make some money with Five Nights at Freddy's. And at that point, though, well, <laughs> what else do they have? Because they do also have their own sets of flops. There was um, uh, there was the Fast and Furious movie that was a disappointment. And the DreamWorks films. Holy crap, did DreamWorks fell hard this year. Imagine going from the bad guys and uh, you, you, you got the bad guys and Puss and Boost the Last Wish, and this year they have Ruby Gilman and Trolls Band together. That is a big oof right there. Say what you will of how Wish is going or how Disney Animation is going, but the thing is, at least with Disney Animation, I mean, it's not that big of a step between Strange World and Wish, but going from Puss and Boots to freaking Trolls Band together, that's a downright embarrassment. Uh, some people might, okay, well, actually, let me just see, like, I know some people have been saying, uh, uh some people might be correcting me and stuff like that, I don't, like, I'm not a hundred, like, maybe I could be wrong on some of the things I might be saying, like, uh, uh, I, like, some people might be saying maybe Trolls Band Together might be doing okay, but, uh, well, I can guarantee you not as good as, uh, the first, um, uh, became a modest hit, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, oh, I see. Okay, so maybe not. Okay, well, that honestly sucks. I feel like that is a massive injustice. A worthless gar piece of garbage like Trolls Band Together doing better than Wish. That sucks. And Velvet, and because Velvet and Veneer is is trending. Holy crap! That's like a create. That's like. I'm sorry, but this might be a hot take. Velvet and Veneer is like if you take King Magnifico, but literally take out any form of creativity. I'm sorry, but Velvet and Veneer, uh, that, honestly, Velvet and Veneer are garbage. They suck. They're among the weakest DreamWorks villains out there. The, the, you know, they, they just suck. But anyways, um, <laughs> with all that, that said, yes, but... My point is, is that technically Disney is not the only one that is struggling. So are many of the other studios. And unfortunately, the one that I would have to say is um, really getting the short end of the stick here is movie theaters. Because whenever, you know, whenever a movie, whenever a studio like Disney would go and take a massive L, movie theaters are also taking a massive L as well. Like, I can imagine that they're really struggling again. Like, there have only been two movies so far, maybe two and a half, considering Oppenheimer is very close, that made a billion dollars at the box office. So, yeah, it's a little bit of a bigger problem where it's not just, uh, you know, it, it, it's not just with um, other movies. You, you know, it's not just with the studios that are, are having a problem, that are having some serious trouble, but movie theaters as well, because, well, they're not, you know, the movies are not necessarily selling. So yeah, honestly, this is just something that I want to go and express uh, regarding my thoughts on, on the whole scenario with Disney. That, yeah, they do have a massive problem that they really need to reorganize themselves, not just with their approach with their big name movies coming out to the big screen and really or reorganizing everything, uh, especially like with their animated films, with their live action remakes, with their Marvel films, with their Lucasfilm stuff and, and all that jazz. But they should also reevaluate how they go and approach Disney Plus. Because, yeah, like, 
th th this needs to be a bit of a wake-up call for Disney to actually take action and really focus on the quality and realize the reality that they cannot just sell on the Disney name alone. So with that said, we're going to go on to a break, but when we do come back, I will be asking your opinions. So don't worry, this is just to go and reset the timer for the advertisements so that, you know, that so I can activate that. Then you could come back and we'll have all the time so that you could go and put out your piece on it. So uh, stay tuned for that. All right, so now that we're back, let's go and see what the comments have to say. What does the chat wall have to express here? As a, huge, as a huge Disney fan, this is honestly disappointing. It's unfortunate how Disney is struggling right now as a company between Chapek's damage, the strike, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, and the oversaturation of content, especially with the MCU. It's just really unfortunate, and I do hope they can recover. However, I, what I hate most of all, uh, this is going to add fuel to the fire to those anti-woke groups and claim Disney is failing because they're woke. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, there, there's going to be that. But let's be honest here. They don't really have that much. Like, yeah, they're going to go and create their grifting content and conning their fans, uh, like, talking about they're failing because they're woke and stuff like that. But I could argue that, well, technically, that's not necessarily the case. If they're, you know, like, if they're failing because they're woke, then explain how is it that movies like Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse and Barbie became massive hits. So that argument is already dead on arrival. Uh, let's see now. Man, Disney thought Disney thought their 100th anniversary celebration will be going great, but it turns out to be rough. While I do enjoy Wish and Elemental, uh, I enjoyed that more, most of their other content are weak. For the MCU, another factor to why they're not doing well is because of superhero fatigue, as people had enough of them, and the whole multiverse idea started to be overused at that point. And about Wish, you know that's not, you know that's not been doing well when even an Adam Sandler lizard does it better critically. Yeah, that definitely is true. Again, I do prefer Wish over Leo, but still it is a bit of a, it's still a bit of a statement in which how, Disney needs a bit of a wake up call where they need to realize like, hey, you got to make a great, you know, you got to start making great movies again and, you know, add more, you know, add more quality onto the Disney name. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Even someone is asking, why are you guys not taking film criticism well when it comes to animation re reviewers spreading their own opinion for Wish? Yeah. And I mean, like. Listen, I know that I'm not the, you know, I know that I'm like the only animation reviewer right now who actually did enjoy Wish and did enjoy, you know, and did put out a positive review of it. But that, you know, I do not encourage like slandering other reviewers as well. Like, you know, it's just their opinion. Whatever people like Saber Spark or Cell Specs or Shafrillas or anything like that, like, that's just their opinion and that's it you know that doesn't mean you know that doesn't make them bad people you know we shouldn't blame them for like the downfall of wish or anything like that i mean i'm i'm disappointed as well and i'm sad to see wish not doing as well as they should be you know honestly i feel like that treatment belongs to trolls band together but still though don't be going after them just because they didn't like wish honestly that's not necessarily a great position to have uh let's see uh, when it, uh, did I read that one? No, I didn't. Okay. Uh, when it comes to Disney for their 100th anniversary this year, it has to be one of their worst years in recent years, probably since the 2000 decade. Uh, all the movie divisions from Disney for live action, Disney animation, Pixar, Lucasfilm, and even Marvel didn't do well at the box office. And most of their content, uh, content is quantity over quality with out of control production budgets on top of bad publicity, both in front and behind the scenes. Not a good way to celebrate if you're Disney right now. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, let's see what else we got here. I honestly would blame on three major factors. Disney themselves with Disney Plus, quantity over budgeted films, and anti-woke idiots spreading harm about Disney because they hate woke agenda. However, I'm glad Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 and Elemental are doing okay this year. Hell, if Disney Plus shows are actually good this year, uh hell, so, uh shows uh, the Disney Plus shows are actually good this year. Hopefully, Wish will get some success later since it's not fully out worldwide yet. But yeah, 2023 was not a good year for all studios. Again, I don't know if I would really factor in like the anti-woke people. I don't think they're really like, yeah, they are extremely vocal, but I don't think they have as much power as they as they claim to be. Like, honestly, that's just giving them too much credit 
if they would go and be a factor onto the failure. So honestly, no. You know, yes, they are very loud idiots, but they don't have that much power. They don't have that much impact to our society. So I'm just saying. Uh, let's see what we got here. Honestly, this is just getting sad to hear. Like Disney's present, uh, like Disney's present movies, uh, with the uh, acceptance of Strange World or Indiana Jones. While okay, not my favorite. All of them have been great, like Lightyear, Elemental, and Kanto, and I'll even add the Disney TVA movies. Uh, mostly, they de uh, they deserve at least some high priority for their efforts, even if they're flawed. Still, I kind of get it. Maybe a little more quantity for their movies would be nice, especially for their upcoming projects like sequels. Uh, there is hope for them. Exactly. Like... I, I don't think this spells out doom. I don't think this is going to be something in which it will say like, oh, Disney is going to shut down because this is not the first time in their history that they've, that they've faced a massive downtime like this. Like if they played their cards right, they could be able to recover. They, you know, there is that chance out there that they can easily pick themselves back up. Well, let's see what other comments would there be. Uh, I think I might've read that one. I'll be fair and say that the movies came out this year weren't that bad, except Quantumania. But man, I don't think Disney's 100 year could have gotten any worse. I mostly blame the quantity over quality mentality, especially with the MCU, which mostly feels like you need to do mountains upon mountains of homework just to understand the plot. Here's hoping they pick up the slack because Disney, y'all are scraping, y'all are scaring people off, bro. Exactly. That's that's honestly the major thing. And that's why they need to be more careful, not just with uh, that, you know, not just with MCU and Star Wars and stuff like that, but with all of their content so far or all of their projects. OK, I think I'm going to read one more comment before we jump on to the next story. Uh, let's see. Uh, all of these issues surrounding Disney really needed to be brought to light. Between releasing so much more content on Disney+, Plus, the lackluster reception on films like, uh, like Wish, and the ridiculously stupid budgets for their films released in theaters, there's no reason why they are struggling right now. I know it's popular to hate on Disney right now and want to see them fail, but I genuinely do hope they can fix their issues and make them popular brands like Marvel and Pixar feel big and special again. Exactly. It's not really cool to go and say like, oh, you want to see them fail because honestly, it makes you as bad as like the projects you claim that they are bad. So honestly, we can only hope for the best that Disney can improve upon their problems, that hopefully they will find a way to pick themselves back up and listen to the criticism so that they can focus once again on quality so that Disney can can be a reputable name again. All right, so now we're going to be right back. We're going to go and take another break. And this time around, we're going to do a little bit of the opposite. Instead of focusing on projects and franchises that Disney would go and focus way too much on, we're going to be focusing on one of them that they, they have been focusing on a little too less. So we'll be right back on that. Oh crap. I'm back on. Holy crap. Sorry about that folks. Yes, we are back. <laughs> okay. Uh but anyway, so yes. We just went through our entire discussion about the current problems with Disney and how they've been focusing way too much on quantity over quality. And uh the, the weird thing is is that with our next story over here, that is not the case with this property in particular, where it really feels like the issue with them is that, well, they're not bringing enough of that content. And it doesn't look like they're planning to do more anytime, at least soon or next year. And what I am talking about is in regards to the Muppets. Yes, it was unfortunately reported that the Muppets Mayhem, the latest series from the Muppets that they did put out earlier this year in May, well, it looks like it has officially been canceled. And just to give you a little bit of quick context, uh, for those of you who don't know, The Muppets Mayhem is actually a spin-off series uh, in which, believe it or not, it doesn't star any of the main Muppets like Kermit, Miss Piggy, Fozzie, or Gonzo. Instead, this actually... <clears throat> excuse me. But um, this actually focuses specifically on the band, The Electric Mayhem, featuring Dr. Teeth, Floyd Pepper, Janice, Animal, Zoot, and Lips. 
So it was just focusing on them and their legacy and their journey into getting their first ever album. And it, of course, it did feature some live action people, including uh, Lily Singh as Nora. Well, after the 10 episodes, unfortunately, it seems like it didn't really work out. Despite the fact that it did get a little bit of a burst of popularity when it was when it was first released on Disney Plus, and not to mention that it did actually make it to the number one on the Billboard charts, well, technically for kids' albums, but still, uh, it did manage to make that achievement with their soundtrack. Sadly, it doesn't look like there's going to be any more episodes that will be coming soon. However, that doesn't mean that we will immediately see the end of the Muppets just yet. Now, I don't know when exactly they're going to be putting out their next content. I don't know when is going to be the next time we will see the Muppets again. But apparently, it looks like they are currently at work on the next Muppet series. Uh, specifically, the create, uh, the co-creator of the Muppets Mayhem, Adam F. Goldberg, he went on to Twitter and gave out his massive thanks to everyone. So, uh, just to go and read you here from my source on Adam F. Goldberg's Twitter, uh, he stated, like, on the original tweet, uh, I want to give sincere thanks to the brilliant cast and crew of The Muppets Mayhem. This will forever be uh, the, show, the show I'm most proud of from start to finish. Praying that six Emmy nominations, uh, a number one Billboard album, and 86 to 95% on Rotten Tomatoes means that Disney finally begins the epic Muppetverse. And then, the update that he did put on, he said huge thanks to the critics and fans love uh, that got us six Emmy nominations and a number one Billboard album. Mayhem has truly been the most joyous and collaborative experience of my career. From day one, all I've cared about is creating a Muppet verse, and yes, I am already cooking up more Muppets with Bill Barretta and Jeff Yorks. It's happening. So, despite the fact that the Muppets Mayhem has been canceled, this did not take down the motivation and uh, the spirit of the creators, in which right now they are currently working on the next Muppet series. Now, we don't know what it is going to be specifically, but all we do know is that, yes, it is indeed going to happen. Now, one thing I will say is that, yes, when I first heard the news, I was pretty disappointed. I mean, honestly, it really did suck to hear that, well, we got another Muppet series that got quickly canceled and that it's not going to have a season two. In fact, I would just like to go and state that technically, um, the Muppets never had anything with a season two since uh, Muppets Tonight back in the 1990s. And I know some people would technically say that, well, may well, technically there is the, um, the Muppet Babies reboot that went on for a few seasons, but that didn't necessarily count. I mean specifically with the main Muppets as is, like the use of puppetry and all that kind of stuff. I don't mean the animated reboot and stuff like that. I mean, I'm focusing on the Muppets in particular. And it really did suck because, to be honest, I actually did enjoy Mupp uh, Muppets Mayhem. As a Muppet fan, I actually really liked it, this, and I honestly do consider it one of the best things that uh, the Muppets have put out with Disney in recent years. Like, this is on par with the uh, 20... Uh, well, I don't know if I would say on par, but it's like around the same leagues as the 2011 movie. Now, I'm not going to say that it is a great series because I will say there are some parts that, honestly, it did make me groan. Like, honestly, I did not like the human characters whatsoever. They are unpleasant. Their characters... Uh, the characters themselves are very despicable. And I feel like every time we do focus on them, rather it be... Uh, um, Nora or Moog or JJ or whatever. I feel like it's just been a waste of time because like, I don't care about these characters. I don't like these characters. I'd much rather focus on the electric mayhem because they are definitely the better parts of it because like the moments with the Muppets, with the electric mayhem, honestly, they're fantastic. Like it's just a blast watching the, mu these Muppets in particular, it, you know, honestly, like they really nailed the humor. It's a really funny series. They got the person, you know, the personalities are great. I also really like how they expanded their backstories. Like whenever, whenever there's something related to the Muppets, it really does work. And not to mention, like, even all the cameos have been fantastic. So, yeah, it's not the best series you'll find on Disney+, and not even the best Muppet project they did put out. 
But honestly, I did have a really good time and I would consider it to be one of the better Muppet things that they put out in recent years. So yeah, honestly, I was a bit disappointed that they're not going to go and continue the Muppets Mayhem, that we're not going to see this massive continuation with, uh, you know, to see like maybe the, the, the band going on tour now with uh, Nora and uh, the other characters as well. Uh, honestly, like, okay, like it did suck. But what is very interesting is to see the excitement coming from Adam F. Goldberg. Like this right here, I feel like, honestly, it does intrigue me, especially with his motivation of creating a Muppet verse. Now, this is actually something that I did recently do some research in which, uh, by the way, I might as well go, go and uh, confirm this now. Yes, uh, technically, uh, Animation Look Back, The Muppets Part 8 is in production. Uh, however, because of the huge amount of co uh, of content that I have to go and create, like with all the different reviews that are going to be coming out for this month, I do have to go and delay that to January. So I am going to do my best to make sure that uh, the pro you know, the video itself and all the projects coming up, like I, I want to make sure that part eight comes out fantastic. I want to make sure that it comes out great. So I will be taking my time with that. Uh, but anyways, uh, going back to what I was talking about. Uh, the thing is with uh, what what the creators have been ha have in mind with Adam F. Goldberg, Jeff York, and Bill Barretta, what they want to do is a Muppet verse where they want to create projects that specifically look into other Muppet characters. You know, it doesn't just have to always be Kermit, Miss Piggy, Fozzie, Gonzo, and more. Like they want to do other projects that are similar to what we have seen with the Muppets Mayhem, where they would do spin-offs of other Muppets that we don't necessarily know a whole lot of. Like maybe the next project that they're doing right now is maybe a series entirely centered on the Swedish Chef, for example. They could probably go and do that. Or maybe they would do an entire series just on Dr. Bunsen, Honeydew, and Beaker. That can also be an option. Who knows? Uh, maybe they could do one on New Zealand. Like, the possibilities are endless. Like, they got a whole bunch of different ideas on what they can go and do. And in a way, it's kind of like a modern reboot of the Muppets as a franchise, where now they're going to go and try to introduce them as a uh, as a universe. That they're doing the same kind of approach as Marvel and Star Wars, where they want to give each of their characters a massive spotlight. So when we do see them all together, it will feel like a massively exciting moment. You know, like where we really do see an entire group that we've spent a while, like we spend like hours of watching the these programs getting to know these characters and when they do come together it will feel like a, a massive special and some people are even suggesting like maybe some like uh with uh what maybe something uh that would focus on robin that could also be a, an option like especially with the muppets with the massive list of characters that they do have the possibilities are endless hey maybe even like an entire wolf series who knows you know, the, the, like there, there are so many popular Muppets out there. There are so many Muppets that they can go and use that there is so much possibilities of what they can do in order to create that Muppet verse that they would have in mind. Or even just another one that just popped in my head. What about a Statler and Waldorf series? That could also be another option of what they could do. So honestly, I will say that with this entire thing, it kind of becomes a bit bittersweet you know uh, and <laughs> I, I see like people are keep popping up with more different ideas of what they could do and even bringing up um uh, walt you know like maybe something with walter like kind of do you know like kind of see uh like maybe a prequel you know kind of do like what we just saw with ted maybe like a prequel to 2011 muppets and we see like with uh the story of uh walter and uh oh crap i forgot jason say uh jason siegel's character but you know have like you know, have that kind of prequel where we see Walter before the Muppets. That could also be uh, another uh, option as well. The, the, but the point that I am saying is that the possibilities have become endless. And that's why the cancellation of the Muppets Mayhem is bittersweet. Yes, I would have personally liked to see more of the Muppets Mayhem that they would continue the show and that we would see more of the fun uh, with uh, the Electric Mayhem. But on the other hand, though, at least we are at least we know that this is far from the end of the Muppets that 
you know, they are still going to be making more content and we will still see, we will still be seeing more appearances from the Muppets, especially when uh, it was actually recently announced that for the Game Awards, Gonzo is going to be one of the presenters. So we know that <laughs> this is definitely not going to be the end of the Muppets. So that, that that's honestly very interesting. So honestly, overall, I feel like with all this, it, it just goes to show like uh, at least like the motivation for more Muppets is actually there and we are going to be seeing uh, you know, we are going to be seeing more different types of Muppet content, and especially if they are going to be leaning more towards the idea that they'll do a uh, Muppet verse, and that if we are going to get more shows that will focus on other Muppets instead of always like Kermit and Miss Piggy, personally, I'm on board with it. Why not? Why do like how like that would actually be a great idea to have like an expansion, like really get to know many of these characters and like give them a moment in the spotlight. So I, I don't know when the next one is going to be coming out, but we'll see what happens. But hey, as a Muppet fan myself, I, I eagerly await to see what the next Muppet series or the next Muppet project is going to be. All right. So with that said, I would like to go and ask the chat wall to ask you all, how do you feel about the cancellation of the Muppets Mayhem and the possibility of more Muppetverse projects. Are you guys excited for what's to come? Are you a bit disappointed that... <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Are you a bit disappointed or maybe relieved that the show is canceled? Let me know what you think. All right. I'm going to be real. I wasn't huge on the Muppets Mayhem. It was okay, and I love how they expanded on the Electric Mayhem, but I felt like it was more focused on Nora than the Mayhem. But all that aside, I was disappointed with the cancellation, but I am hoping that we end up getting more spin-offs with different Muppets. I would sell my spleen for a spin-off starring my favorite Muppet, Rolf. The Rolf story needs to be heard. They, they, they glossed over it in the 2011 movie, but that story mustn't die, damn it. <laughs> Yeah, you know, honestly, I do agree with you. Like, I, I also do feel like it should have been focused a lot more on the Mayhem than Nora. And I feel like that's one of the weaker assets of the series. But yeah, you know, like, why not actually have a, a Rolf story? Especially like, oh my god, that joke from the 2011 movie, that was freaking hilarious. Like, just like, what about my bat? What about my story? Yo, Rolf, <laughs> you want to join in? Okay, that I gotta say is that that was a great joke. Uh, anyways, um, well, I myself haven't seen Muppets Mayhem. Uh, this is really unfortunate that out of all the Disney properties, the Muppets get the short end of the stick. I'm still glad we are getting more Muppet content, but it's just disappointing. Also, if I had a nickel for every time a Muppet made an appearance at the Game Awards, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Actually, uh, I did. Well, I hate to be that guy, but uh, the Muppets have appeared several times. Actually, uh, they did show like uh, there have been several. Pepe. Uh, it started with Pepe back in 2018, and then there was uh, the Swedish Chef. I believe what? No, not the Swedish Chef. There was Doctor Bunsen Honeydew and Beaker that came in next, and then there was the Swedish Chef, and then they skipped a year in 2021. And then we got Animal, and now this year is going to be Gonzo. So, just want to make that clarification. Uh, it's kind of weird that the Game Awards, out of all things, has a history with the Muppets. <laughs> and it kind of makes it weirder that that that, that because of that, Geoff Kingley ended up making an appearance as one of the, the singing headbutts in the Muppets Haunted Mansion. That's, a, that's an even weirder part of it. <laughs> all right, um... If it wasn't for Muppets Mayhem, I don't think I'll have the chance to finally see the Muppets in person at last year's D23 Expo. They were very funny in person, but the show itself was pretty good, and it had a Weird Al appearance. But I'm sure we will get more Muppets stuff. Also, Gonzo will be at the Game Awards soon. I wasn't going to watch it, watch it originally because there's no GTA trailer revealed happening at the awards, but now I will because of Gonzo. Well, de there you go. And it's kind of weird, too. Like, isn't it ironic that we just went through the discussion of how, about how Disney is spent, you know, Disney is putting out way too much content for Marvel, for Star Wars, for Disney, for Pixar, and all that kind of stuff. And yet, with the Muppets, they're not putting out enough! <laughs> you know, like, why don't give, why don't you go and give the other stuff that Muppet taste? Maybe it will go and help things out. At least everybody will be on the same level. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. 
I have yet to watch The Muppets Mayhem, to be honest with you, despite having the Goldbergs creator involved with the series, which, uh, by the way, I am uh, the Goldbergs fan and called it the best Happy Madison project they made, for those that don't know. I didn't watch it due to my busy life, and I have, uh, and I have, but it, it is sad. Oh, that I have, but it is sad to see that the series is getting cancelled upon hearing the announcement. Hope to see more Muppet projects soon. All right, um, let's see what else do we have here. Uh, what else? would there be other comments? Uh, all right, I'll go with uh, I'll go with two more, and then we'll go on our next break. I did not see Muppets Mayhem yet. I am upset it was short lived. I also like your Muppet verse idea, Matt. Well, it's not my idea. It's uh, it's uh, Goldberg, Yorks, and Barrettas. Uh, but anyways, um, if I were to bring a new Muppet series, it would be the return of the original Muppet Show. I hope to see it be revived in the future. All right. Uh, I'll say now, I couldn't be any more disappointed. It wasn't perfect, but I had a blast watching them go nuts with their humor and an awesome time with their songs. That even you know, that even you know was hoping that they would make a season two. Even I wanted to audition for Zoot. However, I could say it does sound appealing for more Muppet-themed shows to feature individual castmates. And on a positive line, the Mayhem is probably happy they, they ha- they- that they like we're still doing a show we just choose we just choose not to film it uh see you on tour there we go <laughs> yeah that is nice and i do have to say that possibly my favorite album this year has to be the muppets mayhem like whenever i would be on the road and i would drive for a voice acting job or stuff like that often i would find myself putting on the the muppets mayhem soundtrack it is freaking fantastic all right so with that said we're gonna go on to our next break and now we will go and set aside all the disney talk so now we're gonna go and talk about one particular movie that is making a very unexpected uh, a very unexpected comeback but does it need to come back and will it work well we will have to wait and see and welcome back now for our next story we're going to be talking about one specific movie that is going to be making a surprise comeback, or at least an attempt of a comeback, because it did have a little bit of a moment back in the 1990s, and I know that it does have a bit of a cult following to this day, but somehow it looks like maybe there's a demand for more of this, but does it need to come back? Well, we're going to go and answer that as we will talk about the surprise return of Fern Gully, yes, spe ooh, excuse me, specifically Fern Gully: The Last Rainforest, the 1992 animated musical. Now, the big news with it is that apparently the rights to the picture has now been acquired by a company named Machine Media Advisors, uh, in which it is led by Jonathan Steinberg, Susan Steinberg, and Matt. Feige. Uh, don't know if it really has any relation with Kevin Feige, but uh, anyways, uh, as I was saying here, apparently the big thing is that now they have officially acquired the rights to the 1992 movie. And what is their big plan with it? Why do they want to go and acquire it? Well, apparently they want to go and give this, this, um, th this major comeback. They really want to go and reboot it as a major franchise. Reading from my source here on Animation Magazine, it states, Me uh, Machine Media Advisors plan to honor the nostalgic value of Fern Gully while introducing new iterations that will engage both existing fans and fresh audiences. The company is currently in talks with making studio partners for potential live-action remakes and animated movies. The team is actively pursuing strategic alliances in the realms of immersive experiences encompassing gaming and metaverse, as well as extending the Fern Gully reach to the world of Broadway through collaborative partnerships. It would even go on by saying that the Fern Gully re- Oops, sorry. Didn't mean to- Didn't mean to do that. Uh, but anyways, the Fern Gully Rebirth- uh, The Fern Gully Rebirth will introduce new worlds, characters, and weave together compelling storylines crafted to spotlight pressing issues impacting our planet. Among the anticipated themes are the far-reaching consequences of deforestation, the effects of pollution on wildlife, biodiversity, and community action. Uh, and it would, e and the article would even go and talk about 
uh, how it can be a bit of a popular subject even to this day on uh, social media. Uh, in fact, it even says, son of a fish, thank you, the peasant, but I don't need you now. Anyways, uh, upon its original release, Fern Gully The Last Raid Forest generated over $250 million and became one of the best-selling movies in the 1990s. It holds the distinction of being the first film ever screened at the United Nations G General Assembly and sparked increased awareness and advocacy for environmental issues among audiences. The film's impact extended beyond the screen with significant contributions to World Wildlife Fund and a continued presence in popular culture. Fern Gully, content, uh, Fern Gully content has generated over 100 million views on TikTok, 30 million views on YouTube, and trends on Twitter multiple times a year during environmental news cycles. Oh my god, what, what the fridge is going on with uh, Animation Magazine? Anyway, so yeah, that seems to be the big thing, is that now... Fern Gully might be making an unexpected comeback. And uh, the thing with Fern Gully, I like it, honestly, it's been quite a while since I have seen Fern Gully. I'm not going to lie. I think the last time that I have actually watched it was when I reviewed it many years ago. And honestly, like, it's a film where I do see the appeal of it. I do see the charm, and I do see how it does have uh, a fan base, especially when it does have some very strong qualities, especially with, um, especially the animation is definitely gorgeous. Some of the characters are definitely enjoyable, well, mainly because it's the actors who are playing them, such as Batty, played by Robin Williams, and of course, the villain, played by Tim Curry, and well, there are some songs that can be enjoyable, again, like the villain song. But I will say, like, I, it's not necessarily my favorite animated film of the 90s, especially when it feels like, um, it, like, it, it's one thing I will say, I'm not going to say it's dated, but it is a movie that it is of its time. It is a very 90s movie. And even with the environmental message, like, yeah, it definitely is very nice. And, like, it is important to bring awareness to, uh, to climate change and what's been going on with, uh, with the Earth and stuff like that. But there can be times where it is a little too preachy and like, yeah, I get it. It's for kids. So like you want to hammer in the message for them, but sometimes they just keep on hammering and they just won't stop. Uh, but honestly, with the idea of bringing back Fern Gully, I can see where they are going with this. And I get it, especially when there are some where there is still some relevancy with the Fern Gully franchise that, you know, there is, you know, there is that niche audience that still really enjoys Fern Gully, people who are of course very nostalgic for Fern Gully. And uh I can see how it is beneficial of bringing it back, especially when nowadays Unfortunately, environmentalism has become a, a very hot button subject. Like right now, we are seeing some of the dangerous consequences to climate change. And it should, you know, I feel like, yes, it should be more of an emergency that we should go and take action on it, that we should go and actually address these issues, and that we need to be a bit more environmentally conscious uh, with our own actions and with what our society is doing, uh, just so we can go and make sure that wildlife and with uh the environment itself that it need you know like uh, we we have been slacking over the years even though we have been addressing it but i think yes i do get it that it is an important subject matter and who better to go and discuss about it than with the uh with the characters with the fairies you know i i feel like yeah they would you know like why not make them like you know, the poster childs of the, uh, you know, of, of the subject matter and bring them back to go and remind you all, hey, we need to go and save the environment. We need to take more action to fight against climate change. So I do get it. But bringing back Ferngully specifically? That I don't know, honestly. Because again, I uh, this is just my opinion, but I feel like it really is something that is of its time. And I don't know if bringing it back would definitely be a great idea or if it would still resonate as much as it did back in the 1990s. And honestly, there is one thing that I personally feel like is going to be a very serious issue and I feel like it's going to be something that I, I that I felt like is massively integral to the original Fern Gully that it, it's a fact that you cannot bring this back. And that is Batty. What are you going to do with him? 
because Batty is basically, you know, basic, he, he's basically Robin Williams. And unfortunately, Robin Williams is no longer with us. You can't do like what Disney did with, um, with Once Upon a Studio and take some archive footage and then just magically bring him back. You know, you can't really do that. What are you going to do to address Batty? And for I, I know for many fans, Batty is what made Fern Gully a fan favorite. So how are you going to go and address that? Are you going to like not include him entirely? Are you going to go and bring uh, a, a different actor? Are you going to bring you know? Are you going to go and find a way to reboot the character? What are you going to do? Honestly, that's um that 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 that's going to be a bit of an awkward issue, and that's going to be the part where I feel like it's going to be one of, if not the biggest obstacle for Fern Gully. How are you going to go and address? not having Robin Williams again, especially when you have a character that is very, well, Robin Williams-centric as Batty. No one can go and recreate that magic. Even if you do have, like, a great impersonator, like, the fact that, I don't know, I, I don't think people are going to be cool with the idea that you're going to be bringing in someone who's trying to be Robin Williams. Like, okay, yeah, like, maybe the, uh, the Tim Curry villain is one thing. Like, you already destroyed that villain altogether, and you don't necessarily need to bring him back. Uh, but with, uh, with Batty, what are you going to do? That's just, uh... That's going to be a very that's going to be a very awkward moment and if you're not going to be addressing that then I think like the entire idea of rebooting Fern Gully is just going to crumble down altogether. And then there are the ideas of what they want to do. Like okay, it's one thing that you want to go and reboot it and you want to bring in all these new animated movies, you know, like try to take, you know, maybe take a similar route uh, to other nostalgic properties like uh, The Swan Princess, for example, where they would go and make a whole bunch of like direct to home media CG movies. OK, like maybe you can go and do that. But then there are some of the other ideas that I kind of feel like it's confusing and I don't know if there's going to be that much of a demand for it. Like, who, like, uh, is there anybody who really is asking for a Fern Gully live action remake? Is that going to be a th is that a thing that people really do want? I don't know. That that doesn't necessarily sound that appealing, especially when people don't necessarily have that, you know, people are not necessarily into live action remakes. I think uh, it's safe to say that Disney kind of ruined it for most people. So, I don't know, like making a live action remake of Fern Gully not that appealing. I don't know. I'm not on board with that idea. And then there's like so many other things like, oh, let's go and make a Fern Gully game or a Fern Gully metaverse. Why? Did, does, does Fern Gully really need to be a game? Does Fern Gully really need to be to have a metaverse? And like even the Broadway show, like, OK, maybe there can be some ideas with that. But is that really necessary? I feel like honestly, like they're pro like right now, the company is just pro like right now, the comments, uh, the, the, the company is promising the entire world with this, but I feel like it's best to just stick like for now, just, just keep it in animation. Like that's really the best realm that Ferngully is right now. Like maybe bring it back as like, you know, have an animated series. I think that's the best first step that you can do. If you really want to bring back Fern Gully, then probably the first, the best thing you want to start off with is with an animated show. Start off with that, and then you'll be good. Then you'll see if you want to, if there is going, you'll see if there is going to be a demand, and then you'll see if there's going to be more and more uh, that people would want to see from Fern Gully. Maybe more movies, maybe like that Broadway show, or maybe or whatever. Like, I think, honestly, you need to go and start it one step at a time. And I think a good first step is just going to be make a series and then go from there. Because I know that if they just make a show, then you know there is going to be, like, a streaming service that's going to go and happily accept it. Rather it be, uh, like, either Amazon or, actually, Amazon would be the perfect fit for it. I mean, you got, you know, you got a series based on The Last Rainforest, and where do you put it? Amazon. Perfect. Done. The marketing rights itself. <laughs> okay, but no, for real though, like, um, honestly, I feel like they need to go and slow things down. Start off a bit small and then see from there. Because if you're just going to go and jump big onto Fern Gully, I feel like it just ruins the chances of trying to, you know, of trying to have the franchise make a comeback. So overall, I just feel like, I don't know if this is necessary to go and have 
a Fern Gully reboot, and I do see some of the benefits, but there are some major obstacles that they need to go and address, and especially uh, to see, they need to go and re and evaluate if there really is that much of a demand, especially if they are planning these major ideas like a live action move, like live action movies or a metaverse or video games or a Broadway show or whatever. You could promise so many of these things, but start one step at a time to go and see if people would even want more Fern Gully in the first place. All right, so with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall, and now I want to ask you all, what do you all think about a potential reboot to Fern Gully? Are you excited for this? Are you a little hesitant? Es but especially if you are a fan of Fern Gully, let me know what you all think. All right, let's see now. Well, I do think Fern Gully is a decent movie and one of the better Disney clones of the 1990s, I really don't see why we need a live action remake or need to continue the franchise in any major way, considering it's a product of its time. And besides, we already have a live action Fern Gully, it's called Avatar. Exactly! And I mean, well, sorry to bring back the Disney discussion, but Avatar so far is the one franchise that is a guaranteed hit for Disney. So how are you going to address, uh, like, like you know, many people who are not familiar with Fern Gully, like, that, that, that could be another problem for them, is just, how are you going to reintroduce it without making it look like an Avatar ripoff? So that's going to be another major hurdle that they have to go. Uh, let's see. I wasn't a major Fern Gully fan. I mean, I like the movie, but it's not fantastic. But I wasn't expecting this big of a comeback. I will admit they did lose me at Metaverse. I'll never get why they're trying to still make that happen. But still, I do hope they don't ruin it too much. Uh, the following joke is brought to you by the peasants. <laughs> My god, dude. Uh, the diehard Fern Gully, Gully stands won't be crying out, Mom! Baby! Yeah. <laughs> oh god. It just made oh my god, I it just made me remember that sequel. God, like okay, this like the first movie was pro was kind of okay, but that sequel was just god awful. <laughs> Alright, uh let's see now. What else do we have here? I like the first Fern Gully movie. I admire the animation, songs, and characters, especially Robert Williams. He's really funny as Batty. After seeing it making its comeback, uh, okay. I honestly don't know how to feel, uh, but all I could say is that the new owners better take care of Fern Gully. As for a live action movie, no, no, just no. Okay, um, I grew up with Fern Gully as a kid before I stopped watching it as I grew older until I rewatched the movie last year in 2022 when Avatar 2 came out and it was okay at best. Definitely a heavy message, especially, but it was all right. Not sure about bringing the franchise back, but if they just want to start with an animated series and not live action, then it could come out fine. It'll be hard to see how, uh, who will play Batty again, given with uh, Robin Williams passing. Homer Simpson's actor, maybe? I don't know. Even at that, though, like it's been quite a long time since Dan Castellanella did any uh, performances related to Robin Williams. Like, yeah, he did that one job uh, being the genie in the Aladdin series, but I don't think we'll be hearing him again, especially nowadays. If he's going to be coming back as home, uh, like if he's going to be coming back uh, as a Robin Williams character, then he's just, like people are just going to complain that he sounds too much like Homer. <laughs> All right, I'll read one more comment before, uh, or maybe two, or, eh, screw it. Okay, there are still, oh, there's still a whole bunch more. Anyways, um, uh, uh, oh, I believe a Fern Gully fr revival could work. It could reintroduce the film to newer audiences. There could be a prequel to the film which shows the origins of Fern Gully, a television series aimed for children, or just make a series of films for streaming services like Netflix, interesting videos like YouTube, or just release it on home video. Also for Batty, they could do a new voice actor for the character. Yeah, but still though... Like, like if you're going to do Batty, you got to be like Robin Williams. And not many people are really comfortable of the idea of having someone else trying to fill in for Robin Williams' shoes. I'm just saying. Uh, let's see what else we have here. I'll be honest, I haven't heard Fern Gully in years. 
I remember I did enjoy it and do also remember your description of the songs. They're cheesy, they're hammy, they're corny. Uh, they were cheese-filled ham with a side order of corn. Uh, but all to say, this is just feels out of nowhere and making it a franchise is just random. As for a remake and it's real people with wings, uh, oh, uh, however, I do say I could ask for a Broadway musical like those always can work, but all you have to do, uh, all you have to say, not that hope, not that hopeful for it. All right. Uh, okay. So I, I, I think after, after this comment, we'll take our last break. I don't know if they really need to do a remake of Fern Gully, especially if James Cameron has already made a live action Fern Gully like movie named Avatar. I don't believe that not many people know it enough to warrant a live-action adaptation. But still, if they really are going to be bringing back Fern Gully, they better bring back the baddie rap. Oh god, I completely forgot about the baddie rap. Oh no. Oh, are they going to be bringing that back too? Oh man, again, again, just further proves how it really is of its time. Alright, so with that said, we're going to go on to one more break and when we do return even though we have seen how disney has been uh in a pretty bad situation well they're not worse than this company <laughs> <coughs> ah even just the mere mention of it made me choke so we'll be right back for that all right folks this is it it is now time that we are going to go and cap this episode off with the grand finale and for this finale well this will be a bit of a bonus miscellaneous where it will lean more on the crazy than the cartoon and i know this has been a subject that i have previously talked about again and again but this time around we need to go and highlight this story because yeah it's been pretty insane so far like if, like regardless if it really is going to affect the platform or not only time will tell. But still, though, the fact that this is happening, it's just really crazy to see. And what I am talking about, yes, folks, it is now time to return to that nightmare of a website, Twitter. Now, before I go and talk about what we are seeing right over here, allow me to give you a little bit of a backstory, or I will go and explain the backstory as best as I can. So, it all started back in the uh, middle of November, in which Elon Musk was doing his usual Elon Musk things, uh, such as promoting delusional conspiracy theories. And one in particular that caught a lot of attention was one conspiracy theory in regards to the evils of the Jews. So from there, yes, it is a very anti-Semitic, white supremacist-like post- uh, that the person put up and then Elon came in and he replied by saying that yeah this is the actual truth so of course as you could probably imagine a lot of people were very shocked about it and it made its little round of news now at the same time a website by the name of media matters also put out a report that apparently twitter has a very serious white supremacist problem and i really do mean like neo-nazi white supremacist very anti-semitic posts that are being commonly placed onto twitter and not only that but big name advertisers are being seen next to those white supremacist posts and so from there it really scared off uh advertisers especially with the notion that elon musk is being highlighted as a massive anti-Semite. And as you could probably imagine, especially with the news reports regarding uh, the war that's happening in Israel and Palestine, being an anti-Semite really is a hot-button topic. So from there, tons of big-name advertisers decided to go and bail out. In fact, there was a mass exodus of advertisers that decided to completely separate themselves from Elon Musk and from Twitter. And we're talking about stuff like the big Hollywood studios like Disney, Sony, Universal, Warner Brothers, and more, uh, uh, Paramount and more. Apple bailed out, Ford bailed out, IBM bailed out, and many, many, many more. Like really, it's all those big, like think of a big name company, any big name company, and there is probably a good chance that they decided to just 
fully leave Twitter altogether. So as a result, Elon Musk, of course, got very upset. And he decided to go and take action against Media Matters and to go and sue them because uh, apparently he blames their report uh, for the mass exodus of advertisers that we are seeing. So it is very ironic that uh, apparently the free speech absolutists of Elon Musk decided to go and sue Media Matters for expressing their freedom of speech. In fact, uh, most if not all legal experts have pretty much said that this lawsuit is going to be a massive disaster for both Elon Musk and for Twitter. Which led me to what we have over here. Now, uh, this week, the New York Times had a deal book summit uh, to which they would go and present many big name executives to go and have a chat about how things are going with their business. And this is the place in which many big executives have said some pretty cringy things, like David Zaslav saying like, oh, it took courage to go and cancel Batgirl and Coyote vs. Acme, or Bob Iger, where he would say, yeah, you know, the reason why the Marvels failed is because we need more executives. Yeah, and, and but Elon, however, he is the king of cringe, and he is the one who went and said to all those advertisers, the ones who have bailed out from Twitter, to go F themselves. Specifically, reading from my source here on Deadline, he actually said, um, Elon Musk made a pl uh, made plain his view of the widespread advertiser withdrawal this month from Twitter. Don't advertise, he urged any marketer with misgivings. Somebody's going to try to blackmail me with advertising? Blackmail me with money? Go F yourself. Go F yourself. Is that clear? I hope it is. He even went on to go and describe that even this move is already damaging Twitter pretty badly, uh, to which he would go and uh, state right over here, uh, what this advertising boycott is going to do is going to kill the company. And the whole world will know those advertisers killed the company. It will be documented in great detail. Now, of course, nobody is falling for that. Everybody, even Elon Musk supporters know that it is because of Elon Musk why the company is even failing in the first place. And if it does shut down, it would be because of Elon Musk. Even the presenter was calling him out on it, trying, you know, trying to explain, you know, trying to explain that that will not be the case. Nobody is going to blame the advertisers. Like um, uh, the presenter, specifically uh, Andrew Ross Sorkin, uh, state, you know, he said that he said to Musk that advertisers would look would likely push back on the notion and point out that he was the one who prompted their pushback. Tell the judge, he said, the judge is the public. Ask if the end game he sees is a large swath of Musk partisans reacting against advertisers that pulled funds from Twitter by boycotting their brand. Musk replied, they already are. Let the chips fall where they may. Which, uh, by the way, I'm just going to say right now, no, they're not. So Elon is pretty much in a position where he is so confident that the reason why Twitter is failing right now is because of the advertisers. And by the way, the, ma the mass exodus is not even stopping. It is still going. Even as recent as Friday, Walmart has actually announced that they're no longer advertising on Twitter because, well, it's no longer commercially viable. There's no real point in advertising on Twitter because, well, the marketing is not really going to be helpful. It's not really going to be beneficial. And they know that the advertisements are not going to be reached out to many people in the first place. And uh, not only that, but even a lot of, uh, of uh, analy uh, analytics and a lot of people have even stated that apparently those advertisers who have bailed out, they don't really have any plans to go and come back in. So really, it's kind of insane what what this situation has all led to. Because it's like, you know, beforehand, it was because of the hot button topic about anti-Semitism and the way that Elon has been promoting it on his social media platform. Or even the fact that he's letting it 
be be outspoken in the first place. The lot the, the the fact that he's even letting these heavily bigoted posts be on the platform in the first place and have advertisers be seen right next to those heavily bigoted posts. You know, it used to be about that, but now with how Elon is expressing himself, the way that he refuses to learn his lesson, really the the only reason why is it that advertisers are not going to be coming back? The reason why Twitter is losing a lot of revenue is just because of Elon Musk himself. Really, he has no one else to blame but him, even if he is incapable of doing so. It, like right now, like the, the little stunt that he has pulled out with that he had pulled off with the uh, deal book summit is that really the problem like the problem is not even about anti-semitism anymore it's just elon like he really is the only problem and he's ruining relationships with advertisers and that is why right now uh reports have even stated that there is a high likely chance that twitter could lose around 75 million dollars in advertising revenue now i know for a billionaire like elon musk it doesn't necessarily sound all that much but then again, $75 million is still an exuberant amount of money, especially a lot to go and lose. And that is the biggest problem right now that is facing Twitter, is that there is a likelihood where they may have to face the reality that a website in which its entire financial system is based on advertising, they're not going to, you know, they're losing advertisement money bit by bit more and more and there is no signs that this could even recover in which it went as bad to the point where elon is admitting that there is a likelihood that this website might not even exist at, uh, in the near future because of how terrible the business has officially become and i'm just gonna go and state this right now honestly in my opinion with how things are going with Twitter. I know that I have said a few times in the past that, oh, because of Elon Musk, uh, Twitter is going to shut down. Twitter is going to be gone for good. Twitter, it, Twitter is going to disappear because of Elon Musk's mishandlings and all that kind of stuff. But I will confess that over time, I do see how there is a very strong likelihood that Twitter is going to stay. Like, it will change a lot, but the chances of Twitter shutting down entirely, it may actually be low. You know, there is still a chance, but it is pretty low that Twitter that Twitter will suddenly be gone. So honestly, yes, even with everything that's been going on, I do feel like there is a stronger there is a strong chance that Twitter is still going to be around. But there is one thing that I feel like will most likely happen. If Twitter is not shutting down, then I feel like another significant change will occur. One change in which Elon Musk is really going to completely turn things around for Twitter, not for better, but completely turn it where it will become a deal breaker for many people to the point where now there would be a mass exodus of users who no longer want to use Twitter because of a major change that Elon is going to do. So I, I know I'm like really building myself up for this, but if Twitter is not going to shut down, I think Elon is going to go and put up a paywall. I think that is going to be the most likely scenario of what Elon Musk is going to do. That he's going to put up a paywall and that he's only going to allow people who will pay for Twitter in order to go and actually use it. I think that's going to be the most likely scenario that could happen. And keep in mind, like, Elon has suggested the idea about maybe actually doing so, and he has started to experiment where there are a few countries like New Zealand and in the Philippines where new users would have to pay if they want to go and create an account on Twitter, but... I feel like with the scenario right over here, like it's not just for a financial reason, but it's more, it's also to go and create a safe space for Elon that he will go in and, and explain that because of the advertiser mass exodus, 
he would have to go and completely change up the financial system of Twitter in order to find a way to make it more financially feasible than advertisements, because obviously they're not working as well as they used to be. So I can imagine he's going to go and try to completely change things up so that it's just going to be advertised. It's just going to be subscription based that the only people who will be using Twitter will be those who have paid for Twitter. Now, what the cost may be, even for the basic package, he can probably do it as far less as like maybe a dollar a month or something like that, or maybe a dollar a year. But still, he's going to ensure that you cannot go onto Twitter unless you give them your financial information. I think that's going to be one major thing that he will do. And not only will he go and put up that paywall, but also Elon wants to go and do it because he wants to create a safe space for his uh, for his website. He wants to go and create a safe space and be so desperate to avoid consequences to his actions so that from there, it will be less likely that people will call him out whenever he would go and spread and, and like support ideas of like insane conspiracy theories that only mass shooters would support like Pizzagate and stuff like that. It's gonna like if it's not gonna be for financial reasons, it would be to create a safe space so that Elon and his fanboys could avoid consequences to their actions and that they could freely be as bigoted as they would wish. And I feel like the moment that can occur is when the court case of Elon Musk versus Media Matters is going to be dropped. When Media Matters is going to win their court case, like when that thing is going to be completely settled, I feel like Elon is going to go and take action and completely change Twitter to the point where people are just going to be fed up and it's going to change so much to the point that people are no longer going to go and use it. And then they'll have to go and migrate onto other websites such as... Uh, Facebook or uh, some of the other um, some of the other Twitter like uh, platforms such as Blue Sky or uh, Threads or maybe even Mastodon and stuff like that. The, I, I believe that would be the most likely outcome of this entire scenario. Now, when is that going to happen? Who the fridge knows? Maybe it'll happen in the next few weeks or the next few months, or maybe it'll happen next year or something like that, or maybe it won't happen at all. Again, I'm just expressing my opinion and I'm just expressing my theory as to what is going on, especially with Elon's temperament. So overall, this like the scenario with Twitter and with Elon Musk is like the more I hear about what is happening with it, the crazier it suddenly becomes. The more unhinged Elon is just becoming with all of these insane conspiracy theories that he is promoting and the amount of damage that he is doing to Twitter again and again and again. Its future has become so questionable. Maybe there is that chance that it will be gone. Maybe it might not, though. I feel like, honestly, maybe it won't, but there will be that one change that will that will make everyone, that, that will, or that will make most people quit Twitter altogether. So, overall, it, it's, it's honestly, um, just, it, it's just been nuts. So, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what's in store for Twitter, but it's uh, it's not good news. I can tell you that. All right. So with that said, I would like to go into the chat wall. And now I would like to ask you all, what do you think about the whole scenario that's been going on with Twitter? What do you think? So, And also, I want to know, what do you think the future of Twitter is going to be? Do you still think that Twitter is still going to be happening? Do you think Elon is going to do a major change to the point that Twitter is going to become unusable? Let me know what your your, your thoughts on. Let, let me know what you think. Okay. Oh my God, where do I even start? First off, Elon, what did you expect from your advertisers after that awful comment? Second, I already regret resubscribing to that ill-fated platform a few weeks ago after leaving it for years. And lastly, I'm surprised that you, Matt, uh, also follow a certain Super X on Twitter. Uh, Super X. Uh, uh, I love his version of the pink Pegasus from Hercules. Yeah, uh, bring on the bonks. Uh, guess what? I'm more than above 21 years old, Mark. Okay, I'm head. I'm headbutt an anvil now. Uh, a certain Super X on Twitter. I don't know which one you're talking about, honestly. Uh, let's see now. 
Everybody should throw tomatoes at him for telling every advertiser to screw themselves because of his cringy comment will cause Twitter to lose so much money to the point of bankrupt or no longer exist. So glad I joined Blue Sky in the first place, thanks to an invite code from my mom. After seeing the boy in a heron in an hour uh, at an IMAX early screening, and I hope it'll be great that some people are making it out to be, and I have only seen uh, images and one teaser trailer and nothing else. Wait, that... There's going to be an early screening tonight? Oh, man, I wish I... Man, I wish I could catch that. Oh, lucky you. I got to wait until... Fr well, I mean, it's coming soon. It's going to be out until Friday, but... Oh, my God, I am so excited for that. All right. Uh, hey, at least a good... Like, after, like, all the calamity with Disney and stuff like that, at least it will be nice to see animation be shown on a positive light with uh, the boy and the heron. Uh, let's see now. At this point, it's getting more and more comical at how Elon Musk is so desperately trying to ruin the credibility of his own social media platform. Also, he somehow managed to be dumber than I could ever possibly imagine. Did he not know that what he said to the advertisers would massively affect Twitter stocks? Whatever the case is, I just want Twitter to die at this point. The negativity and cynicism of that website was so bad to the point that I even had to deactivate my account myself. Oh, I understand, man. I, I, I completely get it. Like, it, like I, I know, like, I, I barely, like, I, I quit interacting on Twitter. Like, very rarely I would ever do so. But honestly, I'm excited for the day that Twitter is no longer popular. You know, that it's not the go-to platform and that people will accept that there will be another place that, you know, at least the animation community can go and interact. Rather it be like on Blue Sky or facebook or whatever like honestly i'm just more excited for twitter becoming like no longer popular uh let's see just when i think twitter can't get any worse here we are i honestly don't blame advertisers for bailing from twitter uh with how much elon is so unhinged and dangerous to the point where the site has become a dumpster fire seriously at this point the sooner blue sky becomes fully avail available to the public the better and we would be better without twitter and, you know, honestly, one thing I am really excited about, like one thing that Blue Sky needs to have that boost, it needs those other features because I know that for many people, the one thing that made them very hesitant to even joining Blue Sky is that there are some things that they don't include, like having GIFs or posting uh, videos or even having a DM system. If they can at least bring in those three things onto the platform, then I think Blue Sky is going to be all set to become the next Twitter. So honestly, like, I'm more excited for them to go and do that because, like, that is, right now, even, like, Blue Sky people are complaining that they don't have that yet. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Elon Scumbag Musk is officially done. Twitter has been dead to me for a long time. Advertisers did something right this time by pulling advertisements out of this god-awful site. If Musk is doing a paywall BS, then no one should be associated with him because I'm sure he will try to take credit card information from people to steal money. I'm sure it's a possibility, but yeah, it's just stupidity at its finest. Now, if y'all excuse me, uh, I'm going to rest up to see the first trailer of the new... Okay, and it's gone. <laughs> okay, and the... Tra oh, and of the new GTA... Oh, the first trailer of the new GTA game tomorrow. Okay, now I understand. Okay. Uh, yeah, even someone even confirmed. Well, I love Blue Sky. It needs a lot more features. Exactly. You know, I would love to see... Um, uh, it, 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 I would love to see the day that we would have more of the... You know, more of those features. It needs it. Um, with all the talk about Twitter shutting, I know people would say go to other sites like Instagram or Blue Sky. While I know Musk is being dumb, this might be a hot take, but one of the reasons that I was hesitant about using other apps instead of Twitter was because even if it actually shuts down, chances are is that aside from Elon himself, all the problems Twitter have might be moved to other platforms like Threads or Facebook or even Blue Sky. And that said, a site will gain the title of that hell site. I mean, yes, it is true. There is that possibility. Like, let's say there is that scenario that that Twitter does shut down and people will have to move to another website. And that kind of toxicity, it will be brought on to other websites as well. There is that possibility. But the thing is, is that in order for those websites to succeed, they need to learn 
from the mistakes of Twitter to make sure that that kind of toxicity doesn't grow to become worse. So one argument that I would say about that, or one counter argument, is that we have learned about what to do to go against the toxicity and to make sure that it doesn't become worse. We know better how to go and have like these fresh websites like Blue Sky or Threads or Mastodon or whatever to go and try to minimize the toxicity as much as we can. And if we can and if we can do so, even if it requires like third party extensions and stuff like that to go and filter out some of that toxicity, then the better we will be. So honestly, yeah, you are correct on that kind of assumption, but I feel like we need, that's why it is integral that we need to go and uh, prep ourselves up so that we could counter that. All right. I think I'll read one more comment before we uh, cap this episode off. Uh, I've already said it a couple of times. Twitter has been on a downward spiral ever since Elon took over. Rate limits, removing the block button, and now making the advertisers flee. Elon is now on thin ice, and if he continues to spread conspiracy theories and tells F you to others, then unfortunately Twitter is done. Also, remember the time you said that the banks may possibly buy the platform? I hope that would happen. If not, many other companies would buy it from him. Oh yeah, I think there could be that possibility that that, that, that could be another option. That the banks are going to be so upset to the point that they're going to buy off of Elon because that's the only way the banks could actually save their money. So it's not just Elon and Twitter who are at risk, but it's also the bank's money. And if Elon's not going to do anything about it, then the banks will. So it's all just to go and say that, yes, Disney is going pretty bad so far, but they're not as bad as Twitter. And with that said, that should do it for this episode of Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast. Let me just go and uh, bring up the title card. There we go. So with that said, man, what a wild ride this has been. But what a fantastic episode we went through. Definitely a lot of fun. And I want to thank you all for joining me on this little adventure. And I would like to also go and state that um, if you would like to go and uh, follow me on more crazy adventures on Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast, don't forget to go and subscribe to my Twitch channel, Animat Live, or also the Animat's Crazy Cartoon Cast YouTube channel. And don't forget to also go and follow me on whatever podcast service you're listening to. Rather it be on Spotify, a Amazon, Google, iTunes, and more. So with that said and done, I would like to say thank you all so much for listening. Thank you all so much for watching. And until next time, see you later, dudes. Yeah.